Welcome to CSIS on a beautiful fall Monday morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be talking today about Russia's role in Asia energy markets. I'm Jeff Mankoff with the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS, and I have the joy of moderating um, our very distinguished panel here uh, as we talk about this subject. Um, back in May, Russia and China signed a widely discussed $400 billion gas deal um, at a moment when the West was uh, busy imposing sanctions on Russia, including on its energy industry. And this deal um, in this town certainly fed concerns uh, about Russia's eastward pivot, uh, about how it was using its energy weapon potentially to deepen engagement with Asia, to put pressure on Europe, uh, to look for an outlet from sanctions. There's a lot of breathless commentary uh, in the press here in the United States about what this deal signified, what it meant for uh, the development of a potential axis between Moscow and Beijing and the possibility um, that in Asia, Russia would be able to find a redoubt against the effect of sanctions that were being imposed by the West uh, on its energy sector. Uh, so today, I think we're gonna try and separate some of the fact from the myth uh, about Russia's engagement with Asia on energy. And we have, as I said, a very uh, distinguished panel to help us work through some of the complexities of uh, Russia's eastward energy engagement and Russia's Asian diplomacy. Um, we're gonna go in the order uh, that we have seated here at uh, the table. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by Shoichi Ito, a senior analyst at the Institute for Energy Economics uh, in Tokyo and a former visiting fellow here at CSIS, um, who's going to give a uh, slide presentation on uh, Russia's role in Asia energy markets um, from uh, his perspective. Uh, he'll be followed by Edward Chow, who's a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program here, who will provide a little more, uh, a wider perspective on the energy aspects of Russia's uh, pivot to the east. And then summing things up will be Andrew Cutchins, who's the director and senior fellow for the Russia and Eurasia program, who's going to step back a little bit and provide more of a geopolitical lens on uh, the developments in this part of the world. After that, uh, we will open the floor up to questions from the audience. We have about 90 minutes, uh, so hopefully we'll have uh, about 45 minutes at least for questions. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Shoichi Ito. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, my name is Sho Tito. I'm a senior analyst at the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. I'm so happy to be back home in Washington, D.C. And um, I just see many of my friends sitting out on the air. And thank you very much for coming. Well, uh, today, uh, as everyone knows, international uncertainties are increasing. One of the, one of the topic is uh, actually energy security. Nobody knows the future magnitude of the uncertainties uh, surrounding the Middle East, Russia, etc. No one has the answer. The, one of the key questions everyone is trying to answer is the future of uh, Russia's uh, geopolitical positioning in Asia, which is quite new for uh, many observers. Well, <clears throat> let's start with a very simple question. Where do we find Russia? For many people, especially in the US, uh, find Russia uh, usually through European lands or transatlantic lands over European continent. This is quite natural, and it is especially so when the Ukrainian crisis is escalating. But one of the facts we have to encounter is that Russia is trying to project its influence based upon its energy resources toward the Asia Pacific. And that's a fact brings us to the question what we should do uh, toward uh, Russia's uh, new positioning in the Asia Pacific 
uh, based upon uh, trans, what they call trans-Pacific approach. Well, this slide shows how the um, strategy is moving. So, okay, it's moving. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me raise some main questions we should discuss today. First. Why does Russia look east when they have uh, the center of um, uh, uh, energy experts are located in Europe when they have uh, more than uh, half of uh, untapped oil resources in West Siberia? Uh, well, second. Um, then we also have the question, how much political and economic resources Russia have in the East to use? Well, uh, the major resources they have is actually energy. But the question is how tangible it is to make the best of untapped resources to increase Russia's presence in the Pacific market. Third, although Russia is trying to accelerate its uh, both geopolitical and economic presence in the Asia Pacific uh, regions, uh, does it really change geopolitical calculus in Asia? Let's review um, three of main Russia's incentives. First, it is quite obvious the, the gravity of global energy market is shifting from Europe to Asia. I have a slide uh, following this one. Second, well, although uh, West Siberia accounted for more than 70% of crude oil production and more than 90% of gas production of Russia traditionally, uh, the uh, pot potential productivity is actually declining. That means they have to hurry up the uh, development of eastern regions, namely eastern Siberia and the Far East, in order to keep up or even to increase uh, hydrocarbon uh, production and export if they wish to in the East. Third, well, to the extent of Russia's relations with Ukraine and the West as a whole is aggravating, uh, they are just find a way out to, to, to find new markets, especially to export oil and gas, although this is not an easy deal, as we see later. Well, As of today, uh, Asia as a whole accounts for uh, less than 10 percent of Russia's gas exports. And within northeastern uh, energy market, including Japan, China, and the Republic of Korea, Russia accounts for only 7 percent of the total gas import of the region. Well, talking about future energy market opportunities, Asia will account for, Asia is projected to account for more than 30% of global gas demand toward 2040, according to the estimate conducted by the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan. We are going to have the latest version in a month's time, actually. And uh, out of uh, Asia's growing gas market, China is expected to account for more than 40% of 
uh, demand graphs. Well, as for oil markets, well, Russia already account for um, about 20% of, oh yeah, sorry, the, the Russia account for uh, only 5% of uh, all total oil import Northeast Asia as of today. But for the Russians, the Northeast Asia really account for uh, roughly 20% of its total export. Once again, China will be the key factor to boost oil consumption uh, in the decades to come. Just is the case with natural gas. Actually, uh, oil consumption is also peaking on the part of Japan and uh, Republic of Korea. So uh, when we talk about the future potential and trajectory of uh, Russia's hydrocarbon resources to the east is actually uh, everything on um, what will happen with China. Well, for the past uh, decade and plus, actually, uh, Russia has increased uh, its crude oil export to Northeast uh, Asia so dramatically. The question is how long they can do that. In a word, well, they have that at, at most already. In order to increase uh, oil exports, crude export to Asia market, they have to overcome an amount of hardships uh, to open untapped oil field in East Siberia and the Far East, which is extremely difficult, which needs extensive introduction of Western technologies and capital. Well, as regards natural gas, although Russia is trying to increase gas exports to, to Asian markets, the best fact is that they have only one LNG pro project, namely the Sahalin 2 in Niger, nothing else. And the Sahalin 2 project is already exporting its maximum capacity. In other words, they have nothing else to export to Asia for many years to come. Well, we can debate on it. It will all, of course, depend upon the impact of the sanctions that may delay uh, the future project. We can come back to this point. Well, we, we are all uh, struck by the, the, uh, the recent uh, Russian's uh, guest deal with China, including the, the uh, $400 billion uh, investment to uh, build uh, the pipeline from East Siberia, namely the power of Siberia, and development of new gas fields over there. Uh, they plan to uh, ship the maximum uh, export volumes of 38 PCM of gas to Chinese market for the next three decades. Although we still don't know whether this will start as early as 2019, that's what they say as of today. Well, it is quite obvious China will provide the biggest gas market for Russia, but China has quite a few alternatives to rely on. Well, they have increased access to uh, gas supplies for Central Asia, a little bit from Myanmar, and LNG projects uh, along the, the, um, the China's cost is increasing in number. Well, when we uh, talk about the future and the essence of 
sign of Russian energy nexus. We also have to bear in mind what if the, the future volumes of hydrocarbon supplies from Russia to China is to be limited in scale. What will be the impact of China's uh, hunting for uh, new resources to meet its surging energy demand? It may uh, increase uh, geopolitical costs to, 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 uh, to be faced with on the path of uh, Japan, the US, and other Western nations in case China needs to find other resources other than Russia. Although, as I repeat, the future of sino Russian energy package is complicated <coughs> enough and its road is not that easy. Well, let me review some stumbling blocks and uncertainties over what Russia calls its eastern energy vector. Well, no one knows the, the, uh, the immediate and the future uh, impact of the West sanctions over the ongoing Ukrainian crisis. The second, although we know that Chinese energy market is a key to development of uh, Russia's Eastern energy development. In addition to new supply uh, sources from Central Asia and Myanmar and LNZ, as I already uh, discussed, China is trying to uh, hurry up its own unconventional gas production, including shale and carpet methane. Well, toward the end of this decade, uh, most experts are rather pessimistic about massive scale of Chinese uh, shale gas uh, production, and China has recently decreased its immediate target. Having said that, though, toward the end of the next decade, 2030, I've reached that increasing number of experts are getting gradually optimistic about China's success in um, developing uh, shale gas. Plus, well, uh, Chinese sustainable growth of economy is in turn a lot of uncertainties. Yes, the scale of the economy is huge, but you never know how long they can keep up the, the current pace of economic growth that will have direct impact upon the future Chinese energy demand. And third, overall investment climate in Eastern Russia is so harsh even before the beginning of uh, the West sanctions after the Ukrainian crisis. Even if the Ukrainian crisis is to be solved out, hopefully, as soon as possible, even in this case, investment quality, climate in Eastern Russia is just terrible. A lot of corruption, the, the climate is, you know, the, the, the weather is so harsh. Lots of energy resources are lying under permafrost where they can do only, they can spend only three to four months a year to do exploration, et cetera. And now we are living in the age of shale revolution. Uh, fifthly, well, this is a point I'd like to bring your attention to once again. Well, now that Russia has to rely more on China to, to hurry up Eastern regions of uh, energy and economic development, this is such a robust fact that they had to accept 
long before the, the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, before the Western sanction. Well, they have drafted a lot of uh, development program over its eastern flank. Every single uh, program they have drafted and published for the past two decades are less than half-baked. They don't know what to do. Well, what kind of implications we can draw from what I have uh, described today for the West? Well, first, the development of Eastern Siberia and the Far East is actually Russia's actors here. When they, they have the energy sector uh, accounting for more than 30% of its GDP, approximately 70% of its total exports, the more than 30% of foreign, foreign investment. Second, but there's no need for the consumers to, to hurry up to get into the development of our Russian uh, Eastern France because, uh, because of the factors including the shell revolution and no, the, the, the other new uh, supply sources of oil and gas flowing into the Asian market and elsewhere. Third, I have to say, sign of Russian energy partnership is not a threat to the West at all, on the whole. To the extent that Russia exports more oil and gas that will, to the Asian market, that will stabilize energy prices and the balance of supplies in the global oil and energy market that will benefit both Asian and European countries in the end. Lastly, I think this is a really high time for us to take into account the Russian fraction from both economic and geopolitical viewpoint as a way to meet Chinese surging energy demand in the long run that will also entail lots of geopolitical implications on the global scale. Well, let's discuss whether we have hard choices or easy choices on this topic. Thank you very much for your kind attention. All right, thanks for that great overview, Shoichi. Um, now I'm gonna to turn to Ed Chow to provide a little um, context on the energy picture here. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jeff, and, and thank you, uh, Shoichi, for giving us a very good factual grounding on, on what uh, the, this deal is about. Um, we, we may just keep your takeaways up on the screen because that's something we can debate a little bit on the panel and, and with the audience uh, uh, later. Uh, yeah, keep the last, your, your, your last slide up there. Um, so I, I, I thought I would um, uh, give a little, uh, highlight a little bit more on the energy realities of, of the deal as, as well as some of the energy uh, implications uh, regionally and, and globally. Uh, I, I would say, first of all, to set the scene a little bit, that both sides really wanted to sign this deal in May uh, for political reasons, uh, uh, political timing reasons as much as, as anything. But I also have to say that the economics of this deal is really, really hard. And, and, and the, my deduction comes from the fact that they've been negotiating for 10 years. If the economics were easy, they would have done this deal a long, long time ago. The economics are really hard in the sense that you have a very, very long pipeline you're gonna to have to build. You have two very difficult uh, gas fields that you have to develop in, in uh, Chayanda and, and Kavika in East Siberia. Um, 
it may be that an export market is necessary in order to do the Power Siberia project, which in economics were always rather dubious. Uh, numbers that we've seen is north of $50 billion to do the whole thing. Uh, and usually by Russian standards, if it's $50 billion, is the estimate, chances are 70 or, 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 or higher. Um, and for $50 billion, you can really buy a pretty good Olympics. Uh, so we're, we're talking about serious uh, money here. It leads to very low net back to the field in, in Eastern Siberia uh, in, in terms of the economics. It leads to not that attractive a gas price at the Chinese border. And, and that's why the bargaining had taken has taken so long, uh, and, and, and uh, because the economics were difficult for both sides. Uh, it's not a matter of one side wanting to take advantage of the other side. The economics were just very hard. Plus, we actually don't know the full details of this deal yet. I mean, negotiations that end at 4 o'clock in the morning in as pleasant a place as Shanghai, uh, it usually means that, 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 no, that there were some unresolved issues. And things we don't know, for example, is the size of the Chinese loans. Uh, what are the terms of the Chinese loan? I, 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 I hope uh, for our Russian colleagues' uh, but, uh, sake that those terms were negotiated before the latest Western financial sanctions against Russia. Because if you were playing the Chinese hand, you say the price of poker just went up, right? Uh, because whatever the terms were being negotiated in May, it, it may be the, the, uh, the risk that the Chinese side will, 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 the risk premium the Chinese side would demand might look uh, a little different. To what extent are the Chinese trying to claw upstream into the gas field? I mean, one of the, the things that China had been trying to do for a number of years is to get equity position in major uh, projects in, in Russia and basically have been rebuffed up until now. Um, so if you are playing the Chinese hand again, you would be wanting to uh, claw upstream for equity interests in both Chayanda and, and Kavikta. And it was the Chinese side that insisted the fields had to be named, that they were not prepared to take gas uh, supply uh, from a pool of gas that, that Ru Russia would decide. Well, we have a hint of that when Rosneft invited China, China to get into the Banco uh, project uh, a week ago or so, that maybe that's one of the things that's being discussed. Um, I hope Andy will enlighten us on whether there are some non-energy trading stock that may also be involved in an energy deal, uh, such as exports of S-400s uh, uh, to, to, uh, from Russia to, uh, to China, a anti, uh, Russia's advanced anti-aircraft uh, uh, system that's been talked about uh, for quite a long time. So we don't even know what all the elements of this deal is and whether it's all done uh, at, at this point or, or, or not. So that, that's my first point. Uh, economics were not easy for, for either side. My second point is that Russia is really late to the party uh, for the Asian uh, um, uh, energy game. Um, the center of gravity for the global oil market shifted to Asia about 10 years ago. Uh, and Russia's been late. Russia's been late primarily because of a number of missteps that Russia it, 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 it itself took. Uh, remember Mr. Khodorkovsky's project of West Siberian pipeline uh, to Murmansk, which would have been the most sensible economic project if Russia wanted to convert itself from what uh, is uh, its role primarily as a regional um, uh, uh, energy player, uh, highly dependent on European export markets, uh, to a global energy player. Murmansk would have been the kind of project you would have done. Uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't do that. Uh, they were late to the party on the East Siberian uh, uh, Pacific Ocean pipeline. Uh, Japan and Prime Minister Koizumi had something to do with that, but we, that's an old story that we can get into if you like. Uh, but in any case, the Chinese built the Kazakhstan to China pipeline instead because Russia was so late to the um, uh, Asian market uh, in terms of oil. Similarly, uh, some of us who are 
been in this business long enough will remember the Ikuts to China gas pipeline, which was about 30 some years in the, in the making. The Soviets talked about that. Uh, and again, we've in under the, the, the Putin Medvedev period, we've gone through more than 10 years of negotiations on this pipeline deal to China. The result of which is China just last week announced that it broke ground on the fourth gas pipeline uh, from Turkmenistan. Uh, this time going through Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan rather than Uzbekistan and, and, and Kazakhstan. So uh, Russia's really been late to this uh, party and it's getting competition uh, from, from Central Asia for sure and, and, and elsewhere uh, as well. And one, of, again, underscoring a previous point, one of the significant differences from a Chinese point of view is that the Central Asians have allowed equity investments and the Russians up until now have not allowed large scale equity uh, investments. And, and, um, and, and the last point, which is why I really want to um, uh, keep Shoichi's takeaways up there is that um, the idea, the, his second point, the idea that no, there's no need for consumer countries to compete. Um, I, I, I think as an energy expert, I agree. Um, some of us were at a, meet, at a conference, Tom, um, uh, in Seoul uh, in the beginning of July, and all energy experts agree that there's no reason for Korea, China, and, and Japan to compete for energy resources. The problem is that you, we agree at the expert level, the politicians don't necessarily agree, right? Um, and, and we've had a number of years now of, of uh, annual um, ministerial meetings of Japan, China, and, and, and uh, Korea for the last three, four years, and which have led to nowhere in, in the discussion. So on the one hand, you've got um, uh, from a purely energy point of view, saying that more incremental supply onto the world market is always a good thing. As major consuming regions of the world, Asia should welcome that. It should welcome all uh, uh, sensible infrastructure to get that oil and gas to, to market. On the other hand, there is geopolitical competition uh, in the region for the same resources and at, at, at a different uh, level and maybe at a policy maker's level that is more important than what we experts believe ought to happen. And so with that question hanging in the air, uh, let's turn it over to Andy. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, thanks so much for uh, taking the initiative to organize this, uh, this panel today. I think it's a terrific uh, opportunity, and I'm delighted to be part of it uh, with my old friends and colleagues, Shoichi and Ed and yourself. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, comment uh, here in Washington and, uh, and over the past uh, five, six months since the uh, Ukrainian issue. Um, came to the fore uh, that uh, both here in Washington as well as in Moscow that Washington is to be aware that uh, we, are, we are pushing Russia into the hands of China uh, and Russia uh, emphasizing that, well, okay, Europe and the United States, you know, we have options and we are going to exercise them and we are gonna go to China. I guess the, uh, the main theme of my remarks is the China-Russia relationship is not all that. Um, and <clears throat> if I'm thinking about the relationship, to emphasize a point that I think that Shoichi and Ed were making, from the standpoint of Beijing, uh, the relationship reminds me of the title of the Rolling Stones' first big hit in this country, which someone in the audience can yell out. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. I like that one. I like that one, Jill. It's not their first hit in the United States, though. Their first hit. I knew somebody was going to come up with that. Head fake. No. Time is on my side. Time is on my side. Anybody who has seen the film Get On Up should actually have answered that question. 
And if you haven't seen the film, get on up, you ought to see it. Because uh, the Rolling Stones were the final act <coughs> at the Apollo Theater in 1964 in their first American tour, and the tune they played was Time on My Side. Of course, they were preceded by James Brown just ripping the roof off the sucker before they came on. At any, any rate, time is on my side. I hope our viewers on the internet enjoyed that. Now, I mean, um, we, hear, we heard about the reasons why time is on their side from an ener energy standpoint, particularly on the gas deal. But, you know, more broadly, it's even more striking. I mean, the, the juxtaposition of the change in fortunes of ec economic powers is, is um, this is already a cliche, but you, know, you go back to the time when I was in college in 1980, uh, where the Soviet economy was four to five times the size of the Chinese economy, and today as we sit here, it's, that's reversed. I don't think there's ever been in peacetime in modern history, or maybe even all of, all of history, the juxtaposition of such a sharp change in fortunes of great powers in peacetime in such a short period of time. And the, the trends for the future are not very, are not very much in Russia's favor, favor either. Uh, a year ago, the Russian Minister of Finance announced that uh, Russia's economic outlook to the year 2030, he was looking at about 2.5 percent annual growth. That which is about 1% below uh, the predictions for global growth at 3.5% for that time. And obviously, while we don't know what Chinese economic growth is going to be, one thing we can bet on for sure, it's going to be a hell of a lot larger than 2.5% or the global average of 3.5%, at least as far as we can, we can think about right now. And, um, and of course, even if we look at where the Russian economy was even before uh, the the military occupation and annexation of Crimea, basically the Russian economy was at zero growth. It was already in stagnation, zastoy. Uh, and this is quite an achievement for Mr. Putin, given that when he took, when he became president again in uh, 2012, uh, Russian economic growth was around 3.5, 4 percent growth. Within the space of two years, the Russian economy came to the point of stagnation. Um, and it's possible that it's already in recession today. If we look at the demographic front, even though China is aging and its population is likely to peak uh, by around 20, 30 or so at around 1.5 billion, uh, well, the Russian, Asia, the Russian population is facing a much more serious demographic uh, uh, challenges. So the, you know, the population today where, you know, it's, China is a little, a little bit less than 10 times the size. By 2030, it's going to be considerably more than 10 times the size of the Russian population. So all of these kind of major trends are not going in Russia's favor in the standpoint of looking at sort of who's got leverage in this, in this relationship. Now, the second point, um, there won't be any more musical trivia questions. <laughs> I was surprised nobody came up with the answer, though. Time, on my, time is on my side. But I guess that's just the old DJ in me. Let's look at the strategic relationship. Um, First of all, the, the first point I think to look at is that each of these countries are on each other's strategic rear, okay? The first priority for China, of course, is looking east, right now in the East China Sea, the South, South China Sea. Uh, and for Russia, of course, it is looking west into Europe. That's their first strategic, strategic priority. Uh, for the two of them, I think the most important uh, aspect of the relationship strategically is to maintain security on the border. Uh, for now and into the future, and of course, given the, the demographic, economic, and we can extrapolate this into military trends in, into the future, that's going to be even more important for Russia as time goes by. So I think for, from Moscow's standpoint, the, the challenge with the China relationship is to try to create mutual vulnerabilities, mutual, or mutual, depend, mutual interdepend, interdependencies. So as a way to have some kind of leverage over, over Chinese behavior, in a way to mitigate the, the problem of advancing loss of, of, uh, of leverage. Um, if I think we, you know, there's much made about the, the China-Russia competition in Central Asia. Frankly, I think this is quite a bit over, overblown. Uh, one, um, you know, for Central Asia for both countries, I think is more of a tertiary, uh, uh, you know, security um, uh, issue, uh, not even a secondary security issue. And I think for both countries, they share the, the mutual interest of, of stability there uh, rather, than, rather than instability. This is more clear cut for China, uh, given their concerns about uh, uh, Xinjiang province uh, and, the, 
and the weaker population there, and also the possibility of, well, the, already the reality of, of increasing terrorist, terrorist attacks. For the Russians, they, you know, they are playing a more of a political game, a geopolitical game in Central Asia, and uh, certainly some countries such as Uzbekistan would claim that the Russians are actually trying to foment instability as a, as a justification for continued Russian military presence in the, in the region. So it's a little bit less clear with Russia. But you know, I think that China and Russia are having this big competition there is just not there. And even from an econo economic standpoint, while yes, sure, certainly in an ideal world, the Russians would like to maintain the uh, hegemony over, over uh, the production of, of uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources, and even more so the, uh, uh, the transit of those resources, the fact of the matter is, is that they don't have the economic capacity to do so. Uh, and that's going to be even more true in the, in the future. Um, the third point, and as we get to one of Ed's, Ed's questions, I think, uh, is kind of looking at you know, how the relationship may, is changing and kind of bringing in the Ukraine, the Ukraine factor. Well, I think one issue of interest, I think, is that the, the Russians and the Chinese had basically, I mean, a lot of, their, certainly if you look at the arms sale relationship and something that they had uh, shared as a common, a common interest more globally was in uh, strategic denial. Uh, the kinds of weapons that the Russians have been providing to the Chinese, those kinds of capabilities, have been principally uh, for the purposes of strategic denial, and denial, of course, to the, the United States uh, Navy and, to a lesser extent, uh, Air Force, U.S. U.S. military, to raise the costs for the United States in, in, def, uh, in interdicting uh, in uh, areas on the periphery of, of concern to, to China. And at a kind of an ideological uh, level in the global system, the Chinese and the Russians had been sharing the uh, sort of the status of the kind of conservative uh, defenders of you know, Westphalian uh, 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 um, norm of national sovereignty over the right to interdict or the right to intervene with the United States. They're fairly conservative. Well, you know, things are changing clearly. Um, Russia uh, is, you know, with Ukraine, one would say certainly before with, with Georgia. Uh, some would say uh, you could take this, that actually what we're seeing in Ukraine is not, is not new at all, that the, this is uh, the kind of Russian behavior that we saw, you know, going back to Abkhazia uh, in Georgia in 1992 and Transnistria, et cetera. Um, but rather than strategic, rather than access denial to simply access, access to territory. And of course the Chinese are right now engaged in several territorial conflicts with key countries on their periphery uh, that we're all, we're all aware of. And um, I think, you know, one of the things I've been concerned about, and this gets to Ed's question as to what could be the, the kind of the quid pro quo, what do the, what do the Chinese get uh, from the Russians for consummating the gas deal? For the, for the things that are not particularly, were not directly related to the to the gas deal, and maybe it's not even the gas deal doesn't even come come to mind here. But I think for certain, uh, China would like for Russia to move away from its position of a studied neutrality in Chinese territorial disputes. And with the, <laughs> I wonder when, for example. Uh, President Xi was informed by Mr. Putin about the plan for Crimea. I wonder how much a consultation has gone on between Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi uh, about Russian designs in Ukraine, uh, possible Russian designs elsewhere. I mean, uh, one concern that has been in the back of my mind has been the possibility of some kind of informal condominium between Russia and China about their various territorial disputes. Uh, this is something I just put out there. But I think there are real limitations to that. Uh, for example, there was a question uh, on a listserv that I belong to that uh, came up about Kazakhstan. And the question was, well, what would prevent Russia from doing to Kazakhstan what it is doing to Ukraine? 
my immediate response was China. China would never tolerate, I think, what uh, Russia's, Russia's try, move to try to make a territorial grab in, in Kazakhstan. This is a country in which China has much greater strategic interest. They've spent a lot of time and a lot of money cultivating this relationship, and I think that would be a no-go. Uh, Turkmenistan, I would also put in, that, put in that category, but of course it's not geographically contiguous with Russia, so some kind of military operation there would be much more, much more complicated. So I think there are limitations on how far, uh, uh, certainly, if there were some kind of implicit condominium, there are definitely, I think, limitations on how far uh, China would be prepared to see Mr. Putin, Putin go. But that is, uh, and that, that is an area, Ed, that I have questions, questions about in this sort of quid pro quo in this relationship. You, read, you already uh, partially answered the question yourself with mentioning the, uh, the arms, arms sale relationship. And I think there we have to kind of watch uh, that. Are the Russians being, uh, are they, rather than access denial weaponry, uh, particularly for use uh, in, um, in the Asian theater, are the, are the Russians providing weapons and, and, res and, res and the research and development relationship is really the one that I think we have to look at. It's the hardest to look at because it's obviously classified. But are we going from access denial to simply access? And that gets to the, the question about China. Just how, just how aggressive is China prepared to be in its territorial conflicts? I am frankly surprised at how aggressive China has been for the last three years, because getting back to the Rolling Stones maxim, time is on their side. Why don't they simply let the advance of economic power be the lead in basically being able to buy out so they could buy out their interests in these various places? But then you get to political leaders. Mr. Xi, for example, you know, in China, there's a, there's a, there is pretty much of a norm for how long leaders are in power. It's 10 years, the clock is ticking. Maybe he wants to have more of a legacy uh, in this area where he achieves something that, that may be contributing to what, at least for me, from a strategic standpoint, looks to be maybe just a little too forward-leaning, a little bit too, too aggressive. The last point I want to, I want to make, again, it gets, and it gets back to, ah, sorry, and there's one other point about, uh, about Ukraine, of course. Well, with Ukraine, you know, Mr. Putin has, if, it, if we didn't think that the, that, I think we were under the impression, the United States and Europe as well, the European security issues have been more or less resolved. Guess what? They're not. The Russians aren't satisfied with that. That's been made perfectly clear. And so uh, who benefits? Well, clearly the Chinese benefit from this because this, along with our ISIS friends in the Middle East and others, are compromising the so-called Asia pivot. Uh, and that certainly works to China's, China's benefit. So there, there's an aspect of the strategic China-Russia relationship almost in kind of an indirect way where China, China benefits. The last point, Again, because I don't think the China-Russia relationship really is where the action is at. But when I look at, you know, what the, the Ukraine story, and, and especially our effort, the West's effort to try to economically punish Russia, to economically isolate Russia, um, my concern is that uh, there is an acceler this is accelerating a process that was already in, uh, in motion. And it gets back to the point that Ed was making and Shoichi from the outset about because it's not only the energy uh, issues are shifting from Europe to Asia, it's the global economy. There's a, there's a power shift going on. And the economic locus or the, grav the center of gravity uh, is, is moving back in an Asian direction, in an Eastern direction. And there are a couple, so there are a couple of data points I want to point out to that have happened in the past six months that have struck, struck me, even in the past few months this summer is. One of them was the BRICS meeting, the BRICS meeting that took place in Brazil uh, in July. Uh, and there, you know, last year the BRICS, um, they had the, the desire was to establish the BRICS Development Bank uh, when they met in uh, Durban, South Africa. Well, they didn't come to an agreement about that uh, because principally uh, they couldn't come to an agreement about the voting rights for the bank. Uh, and at that time, the Chinese position was to hold that your contribution to the capitalization of the bank would be 
uh, equated, would be correlated to your voting rights. So i.e., if the Chinese made a much larger contribution to the capitalization of the bank, then they would have much larger voting rights. China moved away from that position. And other countries came along and they agreed to it. And the, the development bank has been established. We'll see how it, how it goes in the future. And I have to think that in this, that the situation with Ukraine and the response in trying to economically isolate Russia has had an impact on the thinking of all of those BRICS countries about, you know, basically the United States is, uh, the United States and the West's ca capacity to do this, to inflict this kind of economic pain, it's based upon the dollarization of the global, of the global economy. That is eroding anyway. We are accelerating the erosion of it, I think, with this, and I think this data point suggested that. The other one has to be with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, and what there is interesting to me is that they've, they're moving forward with the uh, uh, membership expansion. And the key member here really is India. Uh, and there, the Chinese had been opposed to the Indian membership. Now, India and Pakistan have to go in as a package deal to the, to the SCO. That's understood for obvious, obvious re reasons. Um, but the, Indian, and the Indians have been holding back on this. Well, they've changed their position on this, appar apparently. And I, I was in India a few weeks ago, and what I was told by, by economists and, and uh, political folks, folks there was that basically the Chinese are seeing the dr dramatic growth in the Indian economy. And in fact, uh, China for India is, China is India's number one trade partner already. Uh, and Chinese see the, kind of the amount of infrastructure that needs to be built in India. They want to build a lot of it. So I think that the Chinese position on that is, has changed for economic reasons, I think, first and foremost. But if you have these new members, I mean, China, uh, excuse me, India, Pakistan, Mongolia, uh, eventually Iran, once uh, UN sanctions are off Iran at some point in the future, even possibly Turkey in the future, you know, you are going to, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, this is going to be an organization, I think, that is going to uh, carry significant weight uh, in the global system. And it will be, to some extent, an alternative to um, institutions that the United States, you know, had a hand in the formation of, going back to the Bretton Woods system, back right after World War World War II. Um, so, to me, it's not that you know that the China Russia relationship is going to uh, be at the at the forefront of of this sort of alternative, um, you know institutional basis for the, the multipolar world that is emerging as we, as we talk, but it's a part of it. It's a part of it, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, great. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask, but since we're um, pushing on time a little bit, I think I'll, I'll save those for now. So let me open it up. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have microphones in the back. Somebody will come give you a microphone. Um, please identify yourself, and please be sure that you're asking a question and not making a speech. Thanks. Over here. Hi, thank you for that. Um, my name is Natalia Liotta. I'm with IHS in their Petroleum Sector Risk Service. My question is about Russian companies' ability to raise capital for energy financing on Asian markets. Um, given the latest sanctions now, they're really limited from European um, and, uh, uh, financial markets. So if you could speak on that, the reality of borrowing from Asia and any limitations Russian companies may face? Uh, well, maybe others can chime in on, on, on the, the corporate financing side um, of, of things and the appetite of, of banks uh, in, in Asia to, to finance Russian companies. Uh, from my point of view, these energy deals have been um, uh, loans secured by supply. So basically, Russia is forward-selling production. Uh, so it, it's, it's really not 
financing in, in the classic sense of, of, of the term. Uh, you, you're providing a loan, interest rates agreed, and repayment is through the supply of oil and gas later. Um, uh, and and to me, it, it seems to set up uh, for the Chinese clawing upstream. I mean, and, and I would say that that's true whether you're talking about Turkmenistan or, or, or Russia. If your project gets into trouble, it's really too bad, it's, you still owe us that $10 billion, how can we help you repay it? Maybe we can help you develop that field, together we can cooperate, wouldn't that be a good thing for us to do? So um, it's, I, I, I think the, the idea that there's a lot of Asian capital floating around waiting to um, uh, finance Russian companies um, uh, on the basis of, of its, its own credit standing uh, that's not secured by a project with real oil and gas flowing uh, is a mirage. I, I just don't believe that, that there, that's that kind of money floating around. Okay. Uh, I, the only thing I would, I, oh, sorry. Well, the only thing I would, I, would, I would add to that is that because you, this has been sort of part of the narrative you hear kind of coming out of, out of uh, the Kremlin, that, okay, you know, the West, the West is trying to economically isolate us. Well, you know, we have these options and, and Asians are, are, ready, are ready to come in. You know, Bia, I completely agree with what Ed said, and just let's remember that, uh, you know, just with, with Europe itself, this is about 50 percent of the, the, the trade, bilateral trade relationship for Russia and even somewhat, I think, more than 50 percent for the, uh, the, investment, uh, the investment relationship. And, you know, the idea that you can quickly, uh, you know, replace magnitudes of capital investment uh, like that is, even if, Rus even if the Russian investment environment were considerably more attractive than it is, I think, uh, is a, I think you're going to be hard pressed to, to make that case. Yes, I just would like to add some comment. Although, uh, as we've already discussed today, the Russians, you know, including Rosneft and Gazprom, they're trying to attract more investment from China right now, but the story is not that easy either from Chinese perspectives. They are already raising concern that even they don't want to take excessive scale of investment risks, as I explained already, long before the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, all energy experts know the tremendous scale of investment risks to do something in Eastern Siberia and the Far East. The second, China, Chinese oil companies have their own business and subsidiaries in the U.S. and as well in the West. They are you know, increasingly concerned. They can be affected as a result of getting too much involved in the Russian energy sector. Okay, great, here. Thank you, Nikos Safos, Energy Consultant. Uh, Soichi, I wanted to ask you about Japan. And you think about Japan and for the last few years, the Japanese have been generally lukewarm to trying to import additional gas from Russia. I'm thinking of the Vladivostok project. But if you step back and you say someone else is going to build this massive pipeline that brings you either to the coast or close to the coast, what I wanted to ask you is, are you seeing a change in the way that the Japanese are thinking about the feasibility of additional Russian exports? Once you do build the infrastructure, the incremental cost of sending additional gas to Japan will actually come down significantly. What is the thinking of the Japanese, both government and companies, in terms of what this deal make, makes possible for Japan's uh, needs for gas? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Riyad, for an excellent question. I'm mean, just answering completely on my personal capacity, and the question is very difficult and sensitive in many ways. The first uh, let's put it this way. Uh, well, almost everyone is happy about the recent Russia's gas deal with China, uh, including the, the, the future project of the power of Siberia. If Russia ships 
uh, my gas and the oil, even oil through the Chinese market, just, it will stabilize the region and the market, out of which Japan will also benefit. And as it emphasized today, there's no point to, to, to do any sort of competition over Russian resources. If Russian resources are not available, we can find the same amount or even more amount elsewhere, including Alaska, Australia, elsewhere. Second, having said it so, up until the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, as you noted, uh, Japan has tried to make more commitment in the Russian uh, for some projects. Uh, but, you know, we have more than a few projects over there competing around, and uh, everyone knows the cost is not low, and they're going back and forth. Uh, which one will come out of that? Especially in the aftermath of the, the increasingly optimistic projection of the U.S. shell revolution. Uh, in terms of gas trade, Japan is trying to sh gradually shift the gravity of uh, gas import toward the Pacific side. And third, the whole the business industry, to the extent they have anticipated something to, until the eve of the Ukrainian crisis, they cannot easily say, let's give up. They have their own stakes and investment. And the answer I have heard so far is they simply, do, they simply don't know what to do. And for Japanese diplomacy, although this is something I haven't heard from anyone, but I'm just guessing. But you know, any diplomacy needs both carrots and sticks. Right? Until the very end. And to the extent that we know that Russia's concerns about excessive expansion or what do you call of Chinese influence over the Eastern regions is getting worse and worse. Time is on our side, including Japan. They will need Japan anyhow how many years it may take. If that's the case, it is such a big advantage for not only Japan, but for the US as Japan's ally. We can have it as one of our diplomatic leverages. What we need to have is good combination of you know, Russia's strategy and Chinese strategy as a, as a set. To, to have long-term constructive framework in which we could position the meaning of today's discussion. I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, yes, right here in the middle. Oh, did you? Teresa Sabonis Hoff, National War College. Um, I have a question about uh, both, the, several of you mentioned Turkmenistan and how that may in some ways undercut uh, Russia. With the laying of the fourth pipeline that's now underway and China increasingly being Turkmenistan's monopsony, um, my question is, isn't it more likely that China uses Russia as leverage to force the price down in Turkmenistan because Turkmenistan is much less of a political contender? Whoever wants it. Teresa always keen to answer a Central Asian question from you. Um, it, uh, as it happens, the day the deal was signed in um, Shanghai, I was in Turkmenistan. And, and, and noticed that Deputy Prime Minister uh, Dwarkovich diverted his plane from Shanghai before the deal was even signed in Shanghai uh, to uh, Turkmenistan uh, on, uh, I guess this was a convenient stopover to the St. Petersburg Economic uh, uh, Summit. Um, and had a very long, long meeting with Turkmen officials. Um, I suppose he had some news to bring uh, to, to, to the Turkmen. Um, the industry scuttlebutt 
uh, is that the, the um, uh, Turkmen has been put under some pressure from the Chinese uh, since the deal was signed in terms of future pricing uh, uh, terms. Uh, Turkmen hadn't been particularly happy uh, with the pricing terms even up until recently. Um, notice again uh, that um, a, uh, uh, the Turkmen president uh, visited Beijing a week before the Shanghai meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping. I'm sure that timing was a pure coincidence uh, on, on the part of the Chinese authorities to arrange. Uh, so I, I would say that, uh, again, speculating that if you had China's hand, you would use both sides uh, as leverage on the other, uh, telling the Russians your price that you ask is too high because look at the price that we're getting from Turkmenistan, uh, and uh, at the same time uh, saying uh, uh, to, to the Turkmen that we just signed this deal that committed us to 38 BCM of, of gas supply. We don't need your gas uh, as much as we thought. Uh, I think the price here is Galkanish, which for those of you who don't know, is the largest onshore gas field in the world uh, that is just being developed uh, right now uh, in Turkmenistan. And, and that's what the Chinese are really after, is to secure the future supply of gas. And, and here are other elements, some of which that, uh, that um, Andy referred to uh, gets into the mix because Galkanish gas, in theory, can also go to India uh, via, via the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan uh, a pipeline, uh, India joining the SCO, uh, you know, raises some, some questions. The, the, the question that raised in my mind is that the SCO now has to expand its number of official languages. Uh, because right now the only two official languages for the SCO is, uh, are Chinese and Russian. So if Pakistan and India were to join, the only logical new language to add would be English, right? Uh, which has some, it is some, some irony uh, uh, I I involved. Uh, I happened to be in New Delhi last week. Uh, Xi Jinping may think that I'm shadowing him. Uh, but, um, uh, but the Indians were also thinking about uh, if a TAPI-like uh, pipeline were built from Turkmenistan, it would also open the possibility of Siberian gas to India if you reverse the Soviet legacy Central Asian center pipelines you can start seeing that flowing. Now, a lot of these may be pipe dreams uh, in, in, in people's minds, but, but it gets to be a, a very, very complicated game. Uh, but, but I think the, the, what I would look at uh, in Central Asian oil and gas is the Chinese interest in Kashigan, which as you know, they just bought into uh, the largest oil field discovered in the world in the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, Galkanish, the largest ga onshore gas field, second only to South Pass, by the way, uh, uh, in, in the world. Uh, and, and that's what the Chinese are, are, are after. Well, I don't know if, if Ed is shadowing Xi Jinping, but he is shadowing me. <laughs> I was in Delhi three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're both shadowing <laughs> Xi Jinping. <laughs> and uh, Ed stole uh, a fair amount of my thunder. I would just uh, <laughs> add to your, your question, Teresa, that you know, here I think this is a, in looking at, at TAPI, uh, I think actually this is a case where uh, Russian and U.S. interests are more in line. Uh, the Russians uh, several years ago expressed an interest in being part of the consortium uh, for the TAPI pipeline, if indeed it is, does become a reality. And certainly one of the uh, key talking points, if not, I mean, one of the key talking points to uh, of the U.S. government to Turkmen officials is, you know, don't you want to avoid exactly what you referred to, this monopsony relationship with, uh, with China? And don't you think it would be uh, strengthen your leverage uh, if you had a, a major alternative, uh, and that being TAPI? Um, of course, we've talked to them about another major alternative and being the southern, the southern corridor. 
And that is clearly one in which Russian and European interests are completely at odds on. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the Indians, uh, was, I was struck with um, the level of seriousness and optimism in which they were treating, I would just say broadly, the question of Russian hydrocarbons coming south, oil and gas, uh, respectively. Okay, great. More questions over here in the green. Hi. Hi, hello. Um, my name is... Probably be standing. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Xiao Qing. I am an intern at CSIS Energy and National uh, Security Program. Um, I have a question for Mr. Cochins. Uh, and of course, for other um, speakers, could you elaborate more um, about the elements that might prevent India and Pakistan from joining um, the SCO and the elements that might help them to join the SCO? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, traditionally, I mean, Russia has been the, the key backer within the organization for India's membership, and China has been the key backer for, for Pakistan's uh, membership. But, I mean, the principal obstacle in the past that I referred to was uh, the Chinese position on, on India. Uh, and um, I, th I think that the decision has been, has been taken. Uh, so it's not a matter of whether, it's just a matter of when. Um, and we could see the, uh, the expansion of the membership uh, as soon as um, 20, 2015. Um, I mean, as I look at things right now, I don't see any sort of imminent major obstacles to this happening. Uh, and I think it does behoove us to think hard, both on uh, economic issues in Eurasia as well as security issues in Eurasia, about the uh, implications of this, this development. Let me ask you a follow-up question on that, Kutchins. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, Pakistan and, and India um, joining uh, SCO would fundamentally change the nature of the organization. Uh, and I describe the nature of the organization as a organization that allowed Chinese pen economic penetration uh, uh, of Central Asia with Russia's political concurrence. Uh, that, that's the way I've seen the SEO. I may be totally uh, off base on that, but that's the way I see it. But when you start talking about other regional players, including Iran, including Turkey, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, there's some, some talk of that, it changes the, the, the nature of the organization to a pretty uh, closely self-identified organization with common legacy uh, uh, contiguous geography to, to something much broader than that. I mean, I, I would liken it to, to ASEAN expansion from what was a pretty tight-knit uh, group of five countries in Southeast Asia into what it has grown to be uh, in, in the last 40 years. Um, what, how would SCO function with this broader uh, expanded mem membership? Um, boy, is this next week's panel? <laughs> we, can have, we, should, we should have another, next week. We should get we, soon. We should get together and have this panel on the, on the future of the SCO because I think it is really, really interest, really, really interesting. I, I mean, what has what has been blocking the SCO? I think from being more active on both the economic front and the security front. I think is, has been fundamentally Russian insecurities about the organization being dominated by, by China. Now, with the new members, just with the India and Pakistan, I mean, that, that goes a long way, I think, to diminishing, diminishing that and opening the door for the SCO uh, to become a real player on both economic and security issues uh, in in Eurasia, uh, if we look on the on the security side, I mean everybody uh, in the region, the Central Asians, the Chinese, the Pax, the Indians are well, 
the Indians certainly are, you know, concerned about the post-2014 uh, Afghanistan environment and what and what happens there. Um, traditionally, the the Chinese have been reluctant to play more of a of a role in Afghanistan, but I think there, I think what's been blocking them has been the sense that well, this is basically Washington's game, and so let Washington deal with it. Well, now we're you know we're making it pretty explicit that it's not going to be Washington's game. Uh, and uh, I would expect that the, that there's, a, um, that the SEO uh, I mean, seems to be the, the natural lead organization that would, that would play more of a role there. Uh, now the question is whether the, you know, the, the problem in the, in the organization are the, the mutual animosities and distrust amongst the members of the organization itself, and starting with the China-Russia relationship, which is very ambivalent, the India-Pakistan relationship, which is not quite so ambivalent, um, not, to, <laughs> not, 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 not to speak of the, of the Central Asians' relations amongst, amongst themselves. So I think, I think to get back to your question, um, I mean, it is the, it is the, the, the mutual the distrust and problems in the bilateral relationships within, amongst the members of the organization themselves are, the, are sort of the biggest obstacles that prevent the organization from being much more effective. But I see the increased membership, you know, helping to mitigate that to some extent. If I could actually just jump in on this really quickly. Um, you know, the SCO is, an is a mu big multilateral organization, but in a lot of ways it's also an umbrella for bilateral relationships among its members. And I don't think that that's going to change. In fact, if anything, if you have a much bigger, broader SCO that includes countries that have widely divergent strategic perspectives in some ways, I think that bilateralism at the heart of it is just going to be reinforced. Um, now, what does that mean in terms of the effectiveness of the SCO as an organization? I think that's a question that is definitely um, out there. You know, the, from the Chinese perspective, I think there are, there are growing security concerns related to Afghanistan, but also related to Xinjiang. Uh, where there's been an upsurge in violence in the last year or so that uh, is leading policymakers in Beijing to, to pay more attention to what this organization potentially can do, uh, not only in terms of China's economic interests in Central Asia, but also in terms of these security interests. Um, but whether it'll be able to, you know, manage these, these mutual rivalries, not only uh, between Russia and China, but between India and China, between India and Pakistan. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be a big question. Um, let's get back to energy. Are there any more questions uh, out there right now? Uh, yeah, Anna. Wait for the mic. Yeah. No, Anna Oslund. Um, I'm a consultant called Oslund LLC. I'm just flying from Kiev, so security is on my mind. And uh, you mentioned uh, Russian insecurities regarding China. Mr. Ito said about paranoia. So I wonder, these um, cartoons that were popular after this signing of the agreement between uh, Russian and China leaders, Krim Nash Sibir Vash, it's like Crimea belongs to us, Siberia belongs to you. Uh, that's how Russians interpreted it. And I wonder how much uh, substance is there or is just pure paranoia? How much of Chinese ambition over those really empty uh, between us <laughs> territories of Eastern uh, Siberia, given that the population is 10 times. Um, <laughs> thanks, Anna. That's a great, great, great question. Uh, I, th I think, um, you know, <clears throat> Many, many, I mean, th there is a, a traditional, I mean, my dissertation was on Sino-Soviet relations, so I've been studying this relationship for pretty much all of my life. Um, not to say, not, not, that doesn't mean that I actually learned anything useful, <laughs> but I'll tell you what I, what I, I mean, hearing for, you know, 15 or 20 years, you know, Russians express, you know, concern about uh, the rising power of China. My response to that has been typically, well, I think actually what you have 
you have more to fear than a rising China would be a weak China. Um, you know, with a, with a China with a growing economy, uh, strengthening China, you know, what is, you're not going to see millions of Chinese come across the Russian border to Russia. Uh, I mean, the economic attraction is simply not going to be there for those, those large numbers, which is the visceral fear. It's almost as though, you know, Genghis Khan is, you know, waiting there with his, you know, thousands, millions of, of horses ready to come across the border and rape and pillage. It's right there in the frontal lobe. I mean, it's, it's a weak China where actually Russia would be, look more economically attractive and then China would be less able to control the border. But to me, that would traditionally be, be uh, uh, a, a, bigger, a bigger concern. Um, and secondly, there's the question of, well, oh, okay, once, once China finishes you know, with its territorial ambitions in, with Taiwan and the East China Sea and the South China Sea, then it's going to return back to the, the territories that were uh, taken by the Russian Empire, especially in the 19th century, but not only uh, you know, via unfair treaties, which Russia took advantage of the Chinese Empire during a period of historical weakness and annexed you know, huge amounts of territory. And my response to that is, well, that's why you keep nuclear weapons. Um, it's not that it's, but the, that it's not, it's really not the, so it's not the military threat that I would be concerned about, but it would be the leverage, the long-term leveraged buyout. And so the Chinese, um, and here, if you're, you know, I think it was the global financial crisis that the Russians started to wake up to some extent that, you know, maybe the unmitigated growth of the Chinese economy, where the Chinese were clearly the, the, the winners, is not necessarily, uh, I mean, a great thing for Russia necessarily, and that Russia's game should be to, to create a diversity of investment partners for Eastern Siberia and the Russian Far East. So they are less dependent from being over leveraged to Chinese Chinese capital, um, but then that would require. And you know, Mr. Putin has talked about this going back to when he first came into power. That when he was in Blagoveshensk, I think in 2000, 2001, and he made the reference that well, you know, we have to be concerned about you know people speaking Chinese here. Um, well, if you're if you're really concerned about concerned about that then what you'd want to do actually is to improve your investment environment so that uh, more players are attracted to investing into the, into the region and so that you're not beholden uh, to the possibility if China were to be the, um, the one buyer, so to speak. Okay, uh, let me endorse what uh, Andy has just uh, explained in greater details. Well, I'm the person who spent as many as three years in Havaros, the Far East, as a German while I survived. Well, I have to say, why they love Japanese? Because just because Japanese are not Chinese, I'm not saying good or good or bad, it's a different thing. This is just the, the comparison they have in mind, including uh, the power elite in Russia, in Moscow, and the Far East. So, China, you know, China is the last place or country they could ever deepen partnership with in the end. So, sino uh, russian relationship is bound to be more rhetorical. Although, the, even if they could even develop economic dependence. Number two, for Russia, China is a growing threat, but it is not the case for China at all. Well, considering economic interdependence, US, Japan, other Western partners, partners are far more important for China than Russia. This is a reality. But for Russia, China already uh, ranked the second as its trade partners. I'll stop here. Yeah. Just very quickly, uh, you know, uh, I well understand Russian paranoia uh, about China um, having been 
personal recipient of that from time to time. <laughs> it, it, it takes a Russian brain at least 10 minutes to process an American who looks Chinese. Um, it, 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 but it, it seems to me the Chinese ambition, short of strategic denial to a hostile power like Japan, the Chinese ambitions in the Russian uh, uh, Asia is really very limited. I mean, the, the, what China would want to do is convert the, that part of Russia into Canada. No, a place where you import raw materials. It's a nice place to visit in the, in, in the summertime. Uh, but why would you want to live there? Um, so, <laughs> right. Um, so, so I, I, I think that this is more hype uh, and, and, and maybe quite um, uh, sensational, but, but also um, um, successful hype uh, in, the, in the case of, of given the, the, the Russian psyche. But, Anna, since you just came back from Kiev, I, I want to go back to, to um, uh, one point that Andy made. I think the Chinese are quite concerned about what happened with the annexation of Crimea and, and what's going on in Donbass. The, the analogy to Tibet and Xinjiang is, is just a little too close for comfort uh, for, for the Chinese. Uh, that the Westphalian system, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is supposed to govern state relationship, can break down in, in, in such a way. Um, you know, in, in, you know, Chinese memories are such that um, Russia uh, uh, attacked, some would say, uh, Georgia on August 8th, uh, 2008, in the opening ceremony uh, of the Beijing Olympics. Uh, and it, it, it uh, attacked um, the, um, uh, Crimea uh, and, and started uh, the uh, incidents in, in Donbass right after the ending of the Sochi Olympics. Uh, it, you know, it, these things are, are worrisome uh, to, to a Chinese leadership that's primarily concerned about stability, uh, both domestically and, and internationally. Okay, I hate to say it, but I think we've reached our time limit for the day. So I want to thank you all again for coming, and let's please give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.